Are you ready for another adventure? Ardgillen Castle and Gardens is a real hidden gem. It's set in spectacular parkland and gardens. It overlooks the Irish Sea with a magnificent view of the Mourn Mountains and Lambay Island. In this adventure, I will take you back in time to the origins of Ardgillen Castle, a beautiful castellated country house that has survived the Irish Rebellion and two world wars. It was the home of the Taylor family for 224 years until 1962. Join me as we explore the castle and gardens, now open to the public. By the end of this video, you will step back into the past and learn more about how the Taylor family lived and how the castle's history is closely linked to Ireland's own history. Oh, and stick around to the end because I have a local legend to tell you. First of all, this was a residence but it was called a castle because of the way it looks. It's actually a country style house with castellated features. It was originally called Prospect House and the main central part was built all the way back in 1738 by Reverend Robert Taylor. Now the Reverend bought the lands from a local wine merchant called Robert Usher. The west and the east wings were added in the late 1800s, giving the house its current layout. It sits on stunning 194 acres of land. The name Ardgillen derives from the Irish that means high woods. This was a heavily wooded area before he started developing the lands. Now Robert Taylor didn't use his own staff to develop these lands. He hired soldiers and workers, day workers, and he paid them one penny, a meal, a place to sleep, and some say a moderate amount of whiskey for them to build the house for him. In 1962, Henrik Potts bought the property from Basil Richard Taylor and his wife Gwen, but he only enjoyed it for about 20 years. In 1982, the Dublin County Council purchased the domain. It's now owned by the Finnegal County Council and open to the public as an amazing park and heritage center. Now you might remember Oliver Cromwell in the videos about Carrick Fergus Castle, Malahide Castle and even Hoth Castle. You can check out those videos on the channel page. They're well worth watching as well. Anyway, he was an English officer that became famous for defending the interests of the British Crown in the 17th century. That was a time of a lot of conflict in Ireland. During that time, Malahide Castle was even awarded to him for a short time, interrupting the 800-year occupation of the castle by the Talbot family. Now, what does this have to do with Ardgillen Castle? Well, once Oliver Cromwell defeated the Irish, a land survey was carried out. This was the Down Survey of Ireland, the first nationwide survey ever done in the whole world. The man tasked as chief examiner was Thomas Taylor, and he was Reverend Robert Taylor's grandfather. Thomas took advantage of the situation in Ireland, buying over 21,000 acres of land in County Meath. Eventually, Robert, his grandson, would build Ardgillen Castle. So you can see how the history of the Taylor family is closely entwined with Irish history, linking all these major castles and families and shaping the last 400 years of Irish history. The Great House has been transformed into a museum where you can take tours and see some of the rooms as they would have been back in the heyday of the castle. I decided to take the self-guided tour, so come with me, let's explore the house. As you walk in the front door, you're greeted with a smile at the arts and crafts shop. The tour takes you to the first room, where events are hosted now. You will see some of the furniture and decorations that belong to the Taylor family. The history is displayed along the way as you are taken back to a different time. As I walked around this room, I just kept imagining the elegantly dressed people in their fancy ball gowns and drinking Irish whiskey and chatting as they listened to the music from the piano in the far corner. The next room is the weapons room, but this used to be the billiard room. It has a beautiful fireplace carved out of marble. There's an inscription above it and the translation to it was found in one of Thomas Taylor's notebooks dated from 1760. Remember, he was the nephew of Reverend Robert Taylor, named after his great-grandfather, Thomas Taylor, the one that did the down survey. The inscription reads like a blessing on the house and all of its inhabitants. 
Now all the weapons displayed here are from around 1798, the year of the Irish Rebellion, which happened a mere 60 years after the house was built. Did you know that the Irish Rebellion was inspired by the American War of Independence, which happened between 1775 and 1783, and it was triggered by the French Revolution of 1789? Exiting the weapons room, you walk across to the opposite side of the front room, the gift shop, and the beautifully, elaborately carved doors usher you into the dining room. The carved doors have an interesting story of their own. The doors and the wood panels on the walls are a legacy of Captain Richard Taylor from his time in the castle. They were carved by the Guarnerici Italian brothers, and he had them etch the year, the family crest, and his initials into the doors, making that his legacy. He passed at the age of 75 in 1938, leaving the estate to his nephew Richard Taylor, the last of the Taylors to live in the great house. The dining room is laid out with the furniture, silverware, and dishes as if waiting to host a dinner party. The hunting trophies along the walls are accompanied by a beautiful large mirror. The view from the window is inspiring. On one of the walls, you will find a picture of this very room dated from 1938. Now, once you're done admiring the furniture and the flatware and taking a selfie with the bear, a hidden door in the far wall takes you into the pantry. This is where the food would have been brought up from the kitchen and prepared to be served to the guests. Now this is where you go through all the hallways and the rooms, the kitchen, the pantry. You will find the series of hallways here and at that time you have to remember servants who are not deemed important enough to get natural light or fresh air. So they're quite dimly lit with only a skylight here, a small window there. The kitchen area is where lovely meals would have been prepared, and this is the very nervous center of the house, the hub where the housekeeper would have managed the very large staff, because it would have required a large staff for such a large estate. This gives us a glimpse of how life would have been like for the staff to keep this estate in the very lovely way it was. The tour takes us to other rooms with amazing artifacts that belong to the tailors, along with snippets of history about the house and their occupants. There is a lot of interesting tidbits, portraits, family photos and arts, making the visit even more interesting. Now the last room I visited was the library. This room's walls are lined with bookshelves. They were also commissioned by Captain Richard Taylor. An interesting fact is that the faces of the two interior doors of this library are lined with mock shelves and mock leather books. It's just the book spines. And if you look closely, you will see that they include the Taylor family crest on the spines. One of the main attractions here is the vast gardens and the parkland. As I mentioned before, the estate is open to the public and you're welcome to walk the many paths and walks. You can also bring your dogs for some fun or your kids. There's a kid's playground here as well. There are some seven kilometers of footpaths and cycling routes crisscrossing the domain. Aside from the parklands with wooded areas and 26 acres of wildflower meadows to the west, Right next to the castle, you will find the beautiful walled garden. The garden originally supplied fresh fruit, vegetables and flowers to the house, but now it's one of the main attractions for visitors. The rose garden we see today was laid out according to a map from 1865. There are over 30 old varieties of Irish apples which were planted in the 2000s. There are four glass houses in the walled garden two of which were donated from the Jameson estate in Malahide, you know, the family that owns the whiskey distillery. They were built in the 1880s by a company that is still in business today. These two were dismantled and reassembled in the gardens on the site where the original conservation and propagation houses would have been. Unfortunately, the original ones were too far gone to recover. In the middle of the rose garden, you'll find a beautiful fountain, and it's usually full of water lilies. 
The walled garden is divided into sections, and they even have guided tours of the gardens. If you are into botany, they also have classes in the greenhouses. Did you know that Barnagiri Beach is actually part of the domain? It used to be a private beach, but now it's open to the public, especially after it was separated from the main part of the estate in 1842, when the Dublin Drogheda train line was built. The family gave their permission and cut the property off from the beach, but they had two conditions. First of all, the trains had to stop at Ardgillen whenever they wanted to use the service. And second, they requested a bridge over the track so they could continue to access the beach. The bridge is now known as the Lady's Stairs, and for a tragic reason. You see, the section of the beach to which the bridge leads to was known as the Lady's Bathing Place. And there is a legend attached to the bridge. Now, according to local folklore, the bridge is haunted by the ghost of a woman. And it's believed that this woman is Louise Augusta Connolly. You see, she was visiting the Taylor family. She loved swimming in the sea. So on Friday, November the 4th, 1853, Lady Langford instructed Charlotte Louisa Bates, her servant, to bring her bathing wear to the beach. The sea looked too dangerous and choppy to swim that day, but Lady Langford ignored her servant's warning. When Lady Langford lost her footing as she was wading into the sea, Charlotte raced to help her, but she couldn't get out to her because the sea was so choppy and the waves were so rough. A boat was quickly launched from Valbriggan to find her, and they did, but she was cold. So they rushed her up the hillside, took her back to the house. The servants prepared a very hot bath in the attempt to revive her, but unfortunately, it was no use. She had already drowned. She left behind a young family, and it is said that the ghostly figure that appears on the bridge is her mourning the family she left behind. According to the Fingo Independent, a newspaper that was published in 2012, every Halloween night at midnight she appears on that bridge. And if you are there, she will push you off that bridge. Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, this was the home of the Taylor family for 224 years. And it's steeped in their family history, with each generation leaving a mark in the estate. The Taylors saw the rise and fall of the great house one of the many in Ireland that shaped local politics. The family was part of the social elite in the area, often dining with the Cobbs of Newgrange House, the Hamiltons of Hampton Hall, and the Talbots of Malahide Castle. Let me know down in the comments what you think. I look forward to hearing your stories, especially if you've already visited the house. Let me know what you saw here and what your experience was like. Speaking of Malahide Castle, that was the home of the Talbots for over 800 years. So if you want to find out more about that castle, click on the link in your screen right now. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.